The first, almost the first talk I ever gave when I had my own lab, I went to Caltech and there was this guy sitting in the front row and I started my introduction and about one and a half sentences in he said, stop! And I realized it was Max Delbrook and he said, repeat that. And I did. He said, go ahead. And by then I was a wreck. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to talk about how cells repair their broken chromosomes. This, of course, is the part of uh, rep DNA repair that did not get the Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, the, the subtext is why I've spent my life studying yeast uh, sex life, as you'll see. Um, so when I was 10 years old, this was the big event of 1953, um, which was Hillary and Tenzing climbing Mount Everest. But of course, we know that this is the real big event of 1953. And, um, um, and of course, as was underlined actually in Jim's uh, slides, uh, this is the most famous understatement in all of molecular biology that it did not escape their attention that a specific base pairing that, uh, would, would dictate how DNA was going to be replicated. And so I'm going to talk about uh, replication uh, and errors in replication, but not in the course of normal DNA replication, but in the, in the process of DNA repair. So we now know, and this is incredibly simplified, uh, that the DNA replication fork is a very complicated uh, arrangement, which um, I'll buy the Paul Epsilon, Paul Delta uh, configuration. But I'll tell you now that Paul Delta is going to be the major player in DNA repair that I'm going to talk about, and it's being forced to be the leading strand polymerase. And I think the reason that we have found that some particular mutations, Paul uh, 32, which is a non-essential subunit for normal replication, becomes an essential subunit in many of these repair processes, that particular sites in PCNA are absolutely required for these repair syntheses may all be ways in which Paul Delta is being allowed to be the leading strand polymerase. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the clamp, PCNA, uh, later and tell you that although it is a good clamp, it turns out not to be a good clamp in during DNA repair. Um, and of course, as Tom mentioned, this process is quite accurate in, in doing DNA replication, but it's really mismatch repair that gives you another hundredfold uh, ability to, to remove mutations that have arose, arisen during repair. And I'll tell you later that the mismatch repair system has no idea what to do during the repair processes that I'm talking about, and therefore it doesn't play any role. Okay. Now, that's fine for the kinds of damage that Leona talked about and that Tom talked about. But in fact, DNA replication is fragile in another way, which has not come up yet. And that is that during the process of DNA replication, there is, if, which is revealed by removing a key re repair protein called RAD51, these cells, as they replicate, accumulate these chromatid breaks. And that essentially represents the fact that as the two strands of DNA are being copied, one of the two strands has a double strand break interruption. And, and there are perhaps a dozen of these in every one of our, the cells of our body. If you knock out RAD51, uh, cells are dead. Human cells die in a single generation. These are DT40 uh, chicken cells, but they die in a single generation because you cannot, repl you cannot survive without this uh, double-strand DNA repair process. The only reason that the yeast cell is not dead is that the yeast genome is this big and our genome is that big, but the rate of error is about the same. Um, about one in every 10 yeast cells has a double-strand break that requires RAD51 for its repair. So it's the job of RAD51 to copy the information that is missing from the template, which is here a sister chromatid, and that's a very efficient process. When this doesn't happen, uh, genomes become unstable. So this is, this is the karyotype of somebody. Um, if you take any cell of your body and look at the karyotype, uh, the chances are it will be this stable. The cells have divided a trillion times, and the genotype is entirely stable. And then you look at cancer cells, and clearly that is not the case. These cells have 
uh, terrific DNA repair capacity. They do non-homologous end joining, joining segments of DNA back together with no trouble whatsoever. But what they fail to have is the accurate repair of breaks so that they do not result in these kinds of, of lesions. And most of the cells that show this kind of genome instability have defects in the accurate repair of breaks and or defects in the uh, DNA damage sensing systems that arrest cells, allowing the cells more time to do the repair. Okay, so uh, there, I, as I say, there are very vigorous uh, non-homologous end joining mechanisms. And by the way, they're just as vigorous in yeast as they are in mammalian cells. But uh, what, what the cell has are mechanisms to repair these breaks using homologous recombination. I'm going to talk about two mechanisms. One is where the two ends of the break can each recognize some part of a template and patch it up with a small amount of DNA synthesis. And the other is where only one end of the break finds homology and can copy, at least in yeast, a megabase of DNA to the end of a chromosome. This, of course, leads to the loss of heterozygosity and is a, it may be in and of itself a problem. Um, the key to all of these mechanisms uh, is simply uh, Watson-Crick base pairing because the ends of the broken DNA are opened up. Actually, this strand is often chewed away. And the template is recognized by standard base pairing, and that initiates the repair process. OK, so um, first thing I'm going to tell you about are just how do we see this happen in, in, in vivo. Um, the mechanism that I'm going to talk about is called synthesis-dependent strand annealing. A break is made. The ends of the DNA are chewed away by enzymes that leave single-stranded pieces of DNA. These are coated first by a single-strand DNA binding protein and then by the RAD51 recombination protein. And this filament can then look all over the genome for a partner, making Watson-Crick base pairing and initiating new DNA synthesis from the three prime terminus. But what distinguishes this from normal replication is that normal replication leaves the newly synthesized strand in a semi-conservative uh, arrangement, the same arrangement that Messelson and Stahl demonstrated uh, uh, by using heavy and light isotopes. But if you do that same kind of experiment during this process, you discover that all the newly synthesized DNA is in the recipient. And that's because the newly synthesized DNA is treated more like RNA and it is extruded. Um, and then that newly synthesized strand is the template for a second strand. So the, one of the messages here is that the repair synthesis is not normal DNA replication. And one of the consequences of that is that this process does not know how to behave relative to a normal replication fork. And there's about a thousand-fold increase in the rate of mutation associated with, with this kind of repair. Okay. So, Mismatch repair knows how to work here. Mismatch repair has no idea what to do here. Okay, so I got involved in this before most of you were born. Um, that's a fair statement. Uh, my grant is in the 44th year of its uh, existence, and so I can prove very quickly that I'm not making, making it up. Um, and I got involved with the idea that yeast Budding yeast has an ability to switch from one mating type to the other. A lot of the uh, uh, important work on this was initially done by Jeff Sathern and Mark Clark and Jim Hicks here at Cold Spring Harbor. And the idea was that there is a site-specific nuclease encoded by a gene called HO, which cuts the DNA at this junction and leads to the removal of these red sequences and a copy of these sequences from a donor sequence, which is elsewhere on the same chromosome, um, in order to replace the A sequences, which encodes one mating type, with alpha sequence, which encodes the other mating type. And although, and the cell can do this in the opposite direction, cutting here, allowing repair in the other direction. Now, that means this site here is exactly the same site as here, but this site doesn't get cut, and this site doesn't get cut, because these are in highly heterochromatic uh, regions, which are maintained by the SIR2 histone deacetylase. So these are very highly positioned nucleosomes, which apparently prevent uh, the cleavage of this region. 
If you use Cas9 uh, nucleases, which we've done, some of the sites in this region are actually cuttable, but the site where HO is has been designed not to be cut. So it's a directional repair event using a donor on the same chromosome. Okay, so uh, in 1988, uh, taking advantage of a galactose-inducible version of this nuclease that was made by Ira Herskowitz's lab, we could turn on the cutting in all the cells in the population at the same time. So if you have a restriction fragment here, you could see it get cut into a smaller fragment, and then some time elapsed, and then you could see the product because the restriction sites here are different from here. We could monitor in real time, in vivo, how this repair process was taking place. Okay, and over time, as I've already said, we could look at uh, which enzymes are carrying out this resection step, when does RAD51 load onto the end of the DNA, when does RAD51 find its partner, when does new DNA synthesis start, and so forth. And without showing you uh, all of those data, I'm just going to sort of give you some summaries. But uh, one of the things that's really interesting in this process is how does this RAD51 filament crash around the entire genome to find its partner sequence. And that, that turns out to be something like a diffusion process, and you can model it with polymer physics to say how, how efficient is this process and how long should it take. And we've been doing uh, some of that work with Yoni Kondev, who's a biophysicist at, at Brandeis. Okay, so um, one way to look at this um, has been, uh, as I'll show you, um, to look at the effect of chromosome location on donor efficiency. And this has been done by Anuja Mehta and Cheng Cheng Li, who are grad students who've just gotten their PhD, and Wendy Wong, who, if she applies to your graduate school, you should accept her immediately. Okay, okay. so here's the same southern blot cut. In, in 20 minutes, everything is cut. And then we can ask, when does RAD51 bind to the cut and resected DNA? And the answer is using uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation. We can see when does RAD51 bind to this particular sequence, and that's here about 10 minutes after the cutting is initially uh, visible. And then we can ask, when does RAD51 crash around the genome, search, open up the DNA, and finally find places where it can make stable base pairing that's the intermediate that is necessary to do the repair, and that can be detected because if you formaldehyde cross-link this structure, now you can pull down these pieces of DNA as well as the sequences at MAT, and therefore you can measure how long does it take after it has formed this structure, does it end up forming this structure, and here it's a half an hour because that's the time resolution that this experiment has, but we can see now each of the individual steps in this process. Okay, so uh, we can see when RAD51 binds, when RAD51 finds the partner, and then in another assay that Charles White, a remarkable postdoc in the 1990s, uh, first did, uh, we could see when was new DNA synthesis initiated because we could use a primer which is unique to the donor and another primer which is unique to Matt, and only when there's new DNA synthesis is there a template to do PCR amplification, and so you could see when does new DNA synthesis begin. And so um, these are all slow processes. From the time that this synapsis has occurred to the time of new DNA synthesis is 20 minutes. And that's the time it takes for the polymerase apparatus to get loaded and work. And why it is that slow remains a mystery that you can come to my lab and help solve. Okay, so. The second thing is that we learned very quickly that uh, where the donor was had a lot of influence on how fast the repair event was. If the donor was intrachromosomal, it was faster than if it was intra interchromosomal. And you know that from your first year chemistry course. Somebody told you that an intramolecular reaction was faster than a bimolecular reaction, but I'm telling you a whole chromosome behaves like an intramolecular object and that's very interesting from a biophysics point of view. So we got interested in whether or not it would matter where this donor sequence was placed. And for this, we took advantage of the modeling that had been done by Bill Noble's lab, uh, taking advantage of what is called uh, chromosome confirmation capture, uh, 
to look at uh, the arrangement of all the yeast chromosomes in the yeast nucleus. Of course, this is just a static picture of what's going on, which must be very much more dynamic. But the question was, if we put a donor in one location and cut it with the HO endonuclease, and we put a donor here or here or here, would it make any difference? In other words, are these sites distinguishable by their distance from uh, the site where they have to do the repair? And without showing you all the data, this has just recently been published, you get a fantastic correlation between the distance between the donor locus and the recipient and uh, the efficiency with which repair takes place. So uh, location matters. And moreover, the high C data really turned out to be very predictive of something that it was not designed to predict. This is a kind of independent test of whether this has any validity as a, as a way of thinking about chromosome arrangement. And we would argue that although these chromosomes may very well be occupying much of the whole space of the nucleus moving around with, you know, with, with high uh, velocity, nevertheless, this is a good predictor of how efficient they will be in this kind of a transaction. And we're, um, if you look in mammalian cells, Fred Alt's work and the work of Thomas Deli would argue that translocations happen between sequences which are more likely to be close to each other, and we would say that this is a nice model for that kind of uh, study. Okay, so that has to do with proximity. This has to do with the repair. So it turns out that even though this gene conversion is a very accurate mechanism, it has about a thousand-fold increase in the rate of mutation. And we, did, we started doing this about uh, six years ago now. And, and, and so I'm talking about the sequences which are newly replaced here during this mating type switching system. And here's the, these are the bottom lines. Uh, it's a high rate of mutation, independent of mismatch repair, independent of the error-prone translesion polymerases, dependent mostly on Paul Delta, but a little bit on Paul Epsilon. And about half of the mutations have a signature, which I will call a confused polymerase delta, which does something. It, it, gets, dis, it gets distracted, and then it makes a mistake. And I'll show you the nature of these mistakes. OK, so I have to, I have to I stress you with a little bit of technical detail. How did we do the experiment? We replaced the normal sequences that are replaced in mating type switching with a functional copy of the same uh, reporter gene that Tom talked about, uracil 3 It comes from Cloivermyces lactis, and I will tell you now that's because we were lazy, because somebody else had already put Cloivermyces lactis ur3 in that location. So we used that sequence from Jasper Rhine. It is not expressed because the nucleosomes are highly positioned across this region. So even though it's a functional gene, the cells are ur minus. Now we turn on HO. These sequences are used to replace the blue sequences. And we get cells that are ur plus because now the gene is easily expressed. It's no longer heterochromatic. And we look for mutations that were resistant to a drug called 5-fluoroerotic acid. So these cells are ur minus, um, and, and so th we thought those must be mutations arising during switching. And then reviewer number three came along and said, um, but how do you know they didn't pre-exist here? And so wonderfully, by uh, adding uh, another drug, nicotinamide, which inhibits the SIR2 histone deacetylase, we could unsilence this region. And now these ur minus cells become ur plus because this copy is, in fact, not mutant. Um, and all the mutations I'm going to talk about, therefore, happen during the repair process itself. That was fun. OK, so here's the first 50. Uh, the things above the line are base pair substitutions. The ones in black are chain terminating uh, mutations. And all the ones below the line have some kind of alteration in the length of the sequence. And the most obvious of these are minus one frame shifts. And almost every one of them occurs in a homonucleotide run. It turns out that the same uracil-3 gene has been studied by Andrew Murray's lab and probably by Tom's lab as well. And if you look at how, where you have frame shifts, only about half of the frame shifts occur in homonucleotide runs. So these are, pre these are preferentially occurring in a particular um, sequence uh, motif. And I'll come back to this 
in a minute. So, so we think that these actually, well, okay, so I think these are the same uh, kinds of trans transcriptional errors during replication that people make. Um, turns out there's a technical term for this in the manuscript world. Um, and that is that somebody's copying along, the door opens, they say, hey, did you hear what the abbot did? Ha, 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 goes back to copy and puts in two words instead of three. It's exactly what the, what the polymerase is doing. Okay. You'll never forget it. Okay. <laughs> That's the point. Okay. Okay. So then we had other mutations, which at the time we called weird and totally weird. Okay. So weird ones change bases and also change bases and also add or subtract bases. And Wade Hicks, my grad student, figured out that virtually all of these could be explained by something that should not under any logical circumstance ever happen called quasi-palindrome mutagenesis. And probably none of you, except maybe Tom, have ever heard of this. But here's the idea. Here's the strand of DNA being newly copied. It dissociates and starts copying itself. And then the dynamics of this cruciform structure drive it back to go back where it belongs. And in the course of things, you end up with very complicated mutations. Okay. So that means that this whole segment of DNA has to unbase pair from its template and end up in this crazy event. If you look in the P53 tumor database, there are tons of these kinds of events that have been explained as being mismatch repair driven events. We think that they're quasi-palindrome events. Okay. The other events, the totally weird events, have DNA sequence that didn't come from the Uracil-3 gene, or at least not from the Cloivermyces Uracil-3 gene. But it turned out that we were, as it says here, lazy and lucky, because we looked at this and we knew that this strain contained a copy of the yeast uracil-3 gene, which is disrupted by a transposon, but otherwise the open reading frame is fine. Um, and, and it's only 72% identical to the cloveromyces copy. And we said, what could possibly go wrong? It'll never be part of this process. So if we had been more thorough, um, lesson for graduate students, sometimes being less thorough is good. Um, if we had been more thorough, we never would have seen these events because we would have deleted this. Okay. So what we think is happening again is that the newly synthesized DNA is falling off, going to a different chromosome which is, has sequences that are only 72% identical, copying those sequences. It has to come back, so it requires a second jump to come back so it could complete the process so we could recover it. So this involves two jumps. Um, which, which we really uh, have a hard time thinking how this happens. So my postdoc, Olga Sapanina, had the nice idea that if she made a 32 base pair deletion in this sequence, if you had normal switching, the cells would still be uracil minus. But now, if they did this double jump, they could pick up sequences from this uracil 352 locus, and you would have a chimeric gene that would be ura plus, and that would be really easy to score. And they're the only events now that we get. So we've learned a great deal about, about these events. One thing that we did very early was to answer another reviewer question, is maybe the reason that this is falling off so frequently is because this region is, has these highly positioned nucleosomes and that the polymerase is just falling off because it can't get past these barriers. But it turns out that when you unsilence the locus, the rate doesn't change, and that therefore we think that this nucleosomes are not the reason for this dissociation of the polymerase from the template. Okay, so I need Bruce's artist, because <laughs> this is my bad version. Okay, but here's the thing. So the polymerase, uh, maybe with RAD51 and maybe without, is falling off its normal template, going to a completely different chromosome and copying segments of DNA which are only partially matched. Okay, and the first question is, why doesn't the clamp clamp? And I think it, my interpretation is that the clamp really works in the replication fork to be a good clamp because there are two of them and they are somehow being Joint, they're coordinate in their action, that a single clamp, at least in this repair um, context, does not hold this polymerase very well in place, and it falls off at a high rate. So in the original experiments that we did, 
And, and we've looked for, uh, I'll just say a couple more things. We looked at how much DNA is copied from the, from the mismatched locus. Um, it's not uh, uniform. There's no preferred start and stop. And if you look at one place where it jumps into the sequence, there are all these different places where it jumps out. So there's no place where it starts or where it stops. It uses microhomology as the junctions of these events. But events that have very long microhomology are not super preferred over events that have very small microhomology. And we don't understand that part either yet. Okay. And finally, um, that was where these sequences were only 72% identical. And so when Olga changed the system to have a promoterless copy of the same sequences to do the same experiment, the rate goes up 10,000 times. And now three out of 1,000 events have done these two jumps, and we can recover them. Okay. How often they do one jump and go somewhere and just give up, we have no idea. But it is astonishing to us that we can recover events of this sort at this kind of frequency. And it really does illustrate the fact that the replication machinery during DNA repair is just completely different from the accuracy of normal DNA replication. And so that's um, an interesting question. One question it raises is when Tom does his whole genome sequencing, what fraction of the mutations that he sees are actually not from things just the polymerase errors, but from polymerase errors that are happening during the repair of spontaneous double-strand breaks. OK. OK. Um, the other thing I already told you is that there was this interesting, whoops, it's in the wrong place. <laughs> um, how did that happen? OK, there's one place in this sequence where there are four Cs in a row that, that become three Cs. Now we've added another C so that there are five Cs. And if they go back to four Cs, um, they'll, it'll be OK again. And so this works. We get lots and lots of revertence. And we're now in a position where we ought to be able to see which mutations in the polymerase, in the clamp, or in other aspects of the mach machinery will increase or decrease the rate of frame shift mutations. And I'll tell you that we know already that if you remove the proofreading activity of DNA polymerase delta, that you actually decrease the frequency of all of these events. And we think that's because, as Tom, as uh, Dimitri Gordinian and uh, uh, Peter Berger showed, the, 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 the mutation that removes the proofreading activity stops the polymerase from having to do this every cycle. You must know this, that every cycle it adds a base flips over and checks whether it's a good base, flips back, keeps going, and has a, its own proofreading activity. The evidence from the Burgers and, and the Gordinian lab is that the, that the defective, proofreading defective mutant just moves more processively down the DNA, doesn't fall off as much, and we get far fewer of these events when the proofreading activity is dismantled. So the wild type act, enzyme is making these errors, and the defective mutant is actually uh, suppressing them. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about um, is this crazy event called chromothripsis, which I think you'll hear considerably more about in a minute. It's astonishing that this event was only discovered by Peter Campbell's lab in 2011. It was only discoverable when deep sequencing was deep enough to see enough junctions in a, in a, in a cancer cell to be able to identify what was going on. And so many of you probably know this book. Um, I thought her name was, uh, was Helen Lane. That's how it was taught to me when I was a student. Um, but here she is. And so if you look at Henrietta Lacks's uh, karyotype, um, of course, there are lots of translocations, as I mentioned before. But fascinatingly, the two copies of chromosome 11 look identical. And if you use sky karyotyping, you cannot tell that there is something wrong with one of these two copies of chromosome 11. But there's a lot wrong with one of them. One of the two copies of her chromosome 11 has this chromothriptic event where the whole chromosome has been shattered and stitched back together um, in, in some incredible way. And there are a number of different ideas as to how this might happen. One idea uh, is that some of it happens by replication, 
that the polymerase starts down copying a piece of DNA and then jumps megabases away, copies some more, jumps again, copies some more, jumps, 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 and you end up with some incredible hybrid uh, stitched together segment of, cro of the chromosome by some completely unfaithful DNA polymerase. And so we wanted to understand if we could model that in, in yeast. And so we're using a second mechanism of repair that I mentioned called break-induced replication. Here only one end is designed to have homology to the template, and it starts making new DNA, and it needs both leading and lagging strand synthesis, but work from Anna Malkova and Kirill Lobachev have clearly shown that this is not like a normal replication fork. The second strand is added after a long delay, and there's a big piece of single-stranded DNA first, which is subject to mutation. Okay, so it's unlike semi-conservative replication, but it involves copying both strands. And so, uh, again, this process is mutagenic. Uh, Anna Malkova showed that this process is also highly mutagenic. And so my postdoc, Randi Anand, um, decided to, to try to model this system in yeast. And this is a paper that we published in, in Genes and Development. Um, and the idea was that we would make a break, and there would be a segment of the uracil-3 gene, and it could pair up with a segment of uracil-3 and copy a piece, and then jump again and copy some more. And only when it had done these two jumps would you end up with this uh, intact uracil-3 gene, which, of course, then we could easily um, select. So Ron did a lot of work that I'm not going to talk about, about uh, these events, but what we were basically looking at is what, what, again, we'll call template switching, that the polymerase is capable of falling off, finding a sequence elsewhere in the genome, and continuing its copying. And, and so I'm only going to show you one example of this. And here we, is a simpler version, just the UR, and here's RA3, the rest of the gene, but it's oriented in such a way that it should never be complete. Okay, the, the, if you think about it, the, there's no way to put a new telomere on this without something else happening. It, maybe it'll rolling circle around for a while, but there's, there shouldn't be any viable guys. There are lots of viable guys, and the reason there are is that downstream from this is a repeated sequence, and elsewhere in the genome is another copy of that repeated sequence, and it gets to here, to here, to here, and now it's got a new telomere. So these are complex rearrangements, which we could map with Tom Peters' help, um, and we could show that we had these kinds of, of, of events. The most interesting of these events um, have very complicated uh, events, and they turn out to be identical to the ones that Jim Lupsky's lab has looked at in cancers, which have uh, what they call uh, 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 triplication, duplication, triplication rearrangements, dupe, trip, dupe rearrangements, which is exactly what's going on here. So we have a model in yeast for Jim Lupsky's favorite kinds of crazy events, and we're trying to understand um, how, how we can use this to understand how this instability of the polymerase is really taking place. This is not going to explain all of chromothripsis, but it is an aspect of chromothripsis that we would like to really um, understand. So, um, happy 63rd birthday. Uh, let me say a couple of other things. I first came here in 1970. I was a student in the yeast genetics course that was run by Jerry Fink and Fred Sherman. Um, I drew this map, um, which is not a very accurate one. Um, and, and, among, and interestingly, when I took it, I was the young guy in the class. I was a postdoc, and every, almost everybody else was a professor. Um, it's people learning yeast, and the yeast course really launched dozens and dozens of labs, Randy Sheckman included, uh, in, into, into yeast by, by, by this wonderful course. Um, I was also incredibly influenced by Barbara McClintock, who I got to know as I started to, to teach genetics. I should say I came to Brandeis. They said, you'll teach genetics. I said, I never had genetics. They said, here's the book. OK, so I learned genetics. And then somebody taught me about Barbara McClintock, and I got to know her. And I was really strongly influenced by her thinking um, in, in the early work we did on genome instability. And so, at, as Jim said, at some point, you write the book. So um, here's mine. You can buy it. 
Um, um, okay, so uh, I've mentioned all the people in my lab, these three people who have uh, recently left and, and others in my lab who have done this work. And um, I'm looking for a postdoc, <laughs> seriously looking for a postdoc. So I hope you've come. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. In the beautiful study you showed us comparing intra versus inter uh, chromosomal repair, I'm wondering if you looked at regions that were very close to the telomere, because as you know, telomeres are anchored, and I would think that there might be more difficulty there um, in terms of inter. Our, our own biophysic measurements say that if you're further than 20 kb from an anchor, you're, you behave untethered. So uh, we have not looked at much that's closer than 20. In a, in a study that Wendy, the undergraduate, has done on intrachromosomal recombination, uh, we can tell you lots of interesting things, but the two um, perturbed loci in her study are the two that are closest to the telomeres. So we're sure that there's some kind of telomere effect in this. So did you look at the correlation <clears throat> with the distance on the double jump also? We haven't done that yet. We, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that we, we would like to do that we're doing it right now for the one that Ranjith did, I mean, where I showed you that it made uracil-3 by jumping in, the, in this break-induced replication. We're doing an, a comp competition experiment to see whether uh, location matters. We think it will, but we, we just haven't got there yet. Any more questions? Um, can I ask, is the um, chromothripsis, is that in any way related to the repair that radio durans does? Is there any? After no, actually, Radiodorans uh, takes advantage of having four copies of, of the genome and actually is not particularly remarkable in its ability to do repair, but it does it actually much more by these uh, gene conversion-like mechanisms or, and break-induced replication mechanisms than by stitching. In other words, what it puts back together is a completely accurate uh, copy of the Radiodorans chromosome. Now, the other mechanism that people think is very important in chromothripsis is that a chromosome lags during mitosis, is sequestered in a micronucleus, then unimaginable bad things happen to those sequences, but then the micronucleus gets reincorporated back into the regular nucleus, and that uh, provides a way in which you can imagine one chromosome being uh, badly badly misused and then put back into an environment where the rest of the chromosomes didn't themselves get damaged. And a very nice paper um, uh, in eLife recently shows that not only does this happen, uh, it, well, David Pellman shows this in Nature in a tour de force paper, but it happens in Arabidopsis. And, and the Arabidopsis system is incredibly simple to set up and the genetics should be Fantastic. I, yeast has a closed mitosis, and therefore it's unlikely to have micronuclei. Okay, thanks very much, Jim. Thanks.